You're listening to the B2B Revenue Executive Experience, a podcast dedicated to helping executives train their sales and marketing teams to optimize growth. Whether you're looking for techniques and strategies or tools and resources, you've come to the right place. Let's accelerate your growth in three, two, one. Welcome everyone to the B2B Revenue Executive Experience. I'm Carlos Noche, and I'm joined by my amazingly cool Canadian podcast partner, I think she put this in here. Lisa Schneer. Good morning, Lisa. How are you? I'm well, Carlos. Thanks for asking. <laughs> Up here in the winter and wearing my toque, sitting on my Chesterfield. Nice. Throw a bunch of Canadianisms at you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, folks. Hey, we changed our format a little bit. We're just trying to be a little bit more genuine. If you love it, if you're actually listening, send us a little note over LinkedIn or any of those and let us know what you think. We really appreciate it. We're always trying to make this better for everybody. So for today, we are talking about the powerful intersection between APM, account-based marketing, and RevOps. How do we leverage both in a way that we can be successful at being an APM practitioner, but also an operator? And to help us out with that today, we have Lorena Morales, currently the Director of Global Digital Marketing Revenue Operations at JLL. <laughs> and th that's the first role of its kind for a publicly traded company. It sounds like she's also a live music and festival fan, and she's a huge advocate for human capital. So Lorena, thank you for being here. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Carlos. I think that's the longest title that I've ever had in my life. So people probably like, what the hell does this mean? I was just thinking it's a good thing business cards don't really exist anymore because <laughs> it would be you know, like super long. Yeah, you'd have to have a specially designed one. They did try to give me business cards at the very beginning and they were like, what should we pick from your title? And I was like, oh, better without cards. I'm, I'm okay. Just leave it like that. Yeah, we, got, we all use LinkedIn now. It's funny you guys mentioned business cards. So I just went to a VC event in San Francisco a couple of weeks ago and I'm dusting off my business cards going, oh, I guess I'm going to give out business cards. And I go, nobody gives these out anymore. In fact, I had to dust off on LinkedIn. You know, you could do a little QR code. So I was like, you want to yeah. connect? Here you go. And then they just swiped the QR code and I connected the folks so much easier and it was much more productive than having business cards. So maybe the world's gotten better for, you know, in some ways. All right, Lorena, to get started, we always start with the same question. It's a little bit of a way for our audience to get to know you better. What is something you are passionate about that those that only know you through business might be surprised to know about you? I think my passion for art, it's something like, People tend to, to ask me, like, if you wouldn't be in marketing, what would you be doing? And my answer is always the same. I would be either a very frustrated architect or an art curator, because I think both things have to do um, with one, one, one with each other. But uh, ultimately, art has been in my life since I was very, very little. I spend my time in museums wherever I can. I even chase an artist all the way to Japan just to see her exhibition. So uh, that was a long ass trip but it was so worth it. So yeah, I think art is one thing that would surprise people. Although maybe not so much because the way I dress and the way I, I talk and like the white hair and everything, probably you would, you would think there's something behind it. But, um, but yeah. Well, that's fantastic. And what a passionate uh, hobby that would take you all around the world. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so apart from your, your art career or art passion, um, can you tell us a little bit more about your story, your career, how you got to this position that you're in today? I think, Lisa, it was, it was not a one thing that I can pinpoint. I think it was a combination of, of factors where it was very happy accidents around my career and others that I intentionally provoked. The reality is that I am Mexican, has probably my accent already told the audience. And I was in Mexico. My background is in product design. And so I was very happy doing um, doing everything from services or products. I was very well versed in that, <clears throat> in that ambience, uh, packaging, all that good stuff. And then I realized that I didn't know how to sell anything because I'm a hard introvert, believe it or not. And so with those two things, plus I'm also autistic. So those things, and I didn't know back then. So it was a very interesting kind of realization when I, when I hit that wall, when I was like, Jesus Christ, I, I don't know how to go into the world with this knowledge that I have. And so my father suggested why you don't pursue the thing that you like the most, go back to study. And so I did, and I came to the U.S. 
almost 13 years ago to pursue my first master's degree in international marketing because I thought like, what better way to understand people than to go into their minds? I knew I didn't want to go to medical school to do psychiatrists or anything like that. I also had a lot of problems already. So I, I went like, this is not going to be a good, a good path. And so I came here, I started in international marketing, almost working exclusively for startups because that's why you come to San Francisco. And I fell in love with the city, with the ambience, with everything that I saw in my surroundings. And soon I was back to school again to do my second master's degree in a strategic design management. I moved to New York a little bit to do that. And uh, I came back, thank God, because I think I was too old for New York and too spoiled by California. And one thing led me to another, I think... What has been a commonality in my life is I have found people that believed in me, that believed that I could do things different. I don't know if necessarily better, but different. And so these people allowed me to stay in the country by sponsoring my my visa, which is a really punishing process for immigrants. And there I was uh, around five to six companies sponsored my visa. It was a very tedious process and a very painful one for someone to tell you that you don't belong in the country that you chose is, is heartbreaking. And fast forward, I received my my green card. I was allowed to choose a company for the first time in my life. And I jumped into revenue operations. And so it was an entire new thing for everyone. That makes me one of the original ones. I actually jumped on this on 2018 when it was starting. And so I, the founder back then told me, this is going to be hard. I, people, you need to make people believe it. And so I felt like it was like religion where you don't see anything, where you have to believe something is bigger than you. And that was revenue operations. It was, how do I make sure that businesses start thinking that legacy operations are dead and that there's something new coming that could effectively create more revenue and a better experience for the customer. On today, we're now I'm working at JLL as the first, as you said, the first revenue operator in the company, building the team from scratch. And it's been a fantastic ride. I think now doing it for a 103,000 employee company is a little bit different than in the SaaS space. Amazing. And I can relate to your journey. I did not have to go through it, but my parents did. And obviously I have a lot of friends and family that go through it. I, I think to go through the process to legally come work and be eligible to work, I think a lot of people need an education on how hard it really is. And expensive for a lot of people. Revenue operations, I saw on CNBC, is the number one role right now. It's the hottest job. But what does it mean to be global digital marketing revenue operations? It's an interesting flavor of revenue operations because what you're going to see is that given that it's a fairly new methodology, my personal belief is that there's no such thing as a best practice yet. Because I haven't seen someone that is that has worked broadly enough in different industries or different sizes of companies that can tell you effectively how to apply it to, to different things. And so my hardcore is thinking that everyone is going to take revenue operations as they could and, uh, and with the, the, the resources that they currently have. Revenue operations is ultimately a mindset that you apply and that it becomes a function in a company. And so with my title, what it means is that Instead of living under a COO or a CRO, we live under digital marketing. That's why you see that in my title. A lot of people tell me, what the hell is this? Like you don't see revenue operations in marketing. But when you see the structure of a company that like JLL, where data is more available in marketing than anywhere else in the company, it starts to make sense, the story that I tell. So that's what it means at JLL. So being a former head of sales globally, my operations folks were my godsend, especially when I took over the services business as well. If it wasn't for them, I wouldn't have the facts and details about the business that they provided me, right? And they also gave me a way to look at the business different ways. Like, for example, when I took over services, I would look at all the projects and who were our margin Not only what our margin is, but what is it trending so that I can take action ahead of time before we have a bad project. How do you use data around digital marketing? Are you looking at campaigns? Are you looking at their effectiveness? Are we, can you give me some examples, I guess? I think, Carlos, you don't look at one thing, especially when you have a matrix company. 
And what I mean by a matrix company is we have services that people don't even know us about, like valuations and like design services and like these things that are also really profitable, especially after the economy has shown us a lesson or two in commercial real estate. I think in a company this big, the first thing that you need to make sure is that you have actionable data because our data makes you can imagine that are massive. And so things like you are asking me, how do I utilize data? Generally, my team is the one that is trying to make sure that we tie every single act to revenue. So you write campaigns. So even field marketing, we didn't really touch it because we were digital. We were the digital team. But now with the implementation of OKRs, we're trying to look at everything. So including Great. field and the activities that are not digital per se, among other things like .com, we treat it as a product. So it's kind of our biggest product in the company. So everything combined makes an ecosystem that we need to start understanding what's coming from there, what works, what doesn't work. And working very close to the operations team and to the marketing analytics team has been vital to my role. So because now you're putting together this ecosystem, right? And so maybe we take a step back and talk about ABM. So like a really basic definition for our listeners of ABM and then how are you tying that data back to the ABM strategy? I think for those who haven't heard what is account-based marketing, what it is, it's a strategy that has a highly targeted approach. So instead of casting with a wide net, you have to be very specific on the accounts that you're going for and why you're going after those. And with that, you it, it involves a lot of tailoring. It involves a lot of, um, a lot of content, for example. You need to be very specific about the needs and pain points that you are targeting on individual accounts. So that's what kind of defines account-based. I don't want to say per se account-based marketing because the, and I kind of want and I kind of want it and I kind of don't because it's one of those things that when I was a, an ABM practitioner back in the days, the assumption is that when you say account-based marketing, you are meaning that marketing is accountable for most of the things. I was feeling more comfortable back then was calling it a ABR, account-based revenue, because the reality is that, and you can call it account-based marketing because that's how people know it. And that's why the name of this podcast episode is account-based marketing. But in reality, what we need to understand is that this is not a marketing campaign. This is not a marketing strategy. This is a revenue intelligence type of tool that you can leverage for all the customer touching teams. So the, the idea behind account-based marketing is that you are going to work very closely with sales, especially. Then you can add customer success to the equation and, and other departments. But your first touch is going to be with, with sales. So that's why I like to, to call it account-based revenue because, or there's people that call it account-based everything. So everyone has kind of found their own definition of account-based. But, but the difference is that like sales, if you think about it historically, has always talked about accounts where marketing was talking about leads, like single people. And sales has always been doing it right, where, where they say like it's an account that has individual people inside of it, but we need to target it as a whole. So I think that's kind of a good definition of, of account based. And we can leverage in, in many things, like how do you use the data coming from account based? The first thing is, the insights of an account planning document that you have on each one of the accounts, that's the most useful thing that you're going to have when starting your efforts in account-based. I think the amount of information that comes from socials, from field marketing, from a lot of areas uh, that you can get to know an individual, it's massive. So that's why it's, it's one of the biggest efforts in account-based is to start creating, I mean, apart from scoring the, sco the, scoring the accounts and all that good stuff, you need to be really good at account planning um, and having that documentation in place. That's a, a very eloquent definition of it. And I'll ask the loaded question. How often have you seen this done well? I have seen okay. it. That's a good thing. How often? That's the problem. Because as it has evolved with the years, I think people has been confused on how to really do account-based. And the, the, the other, it's a twofold kind of thing where... The second part is it takes time. It's an approach that takes a lot of time to see ROI. And so people get desperate or they lose the patience and they say like, this is not working. Fuck it. Let's move to another thing. And yeah. so I think that's why you don't see a lot of companies doing it great, but they are out there. They are out there. And especially companies that are 
for example, the tools that are doing a, that are selling the, themselves as ABM tools. I think they do a decent job internally on targeting their accounts because again, like if you're selling an ABM tool, you should know a thing or two to apply internally. That was going to be my next question was when it's done well, is there something like what was the crucial piece that you had? Was it a tool? Was it um or was it the fact that people really understood that account planning? Because you mentioned that's crucial as well. So in a good example, what were the things you had? You had really good the people component, first and foremost, uh, because there's this assumption that when you do something like KVM or account-based, you need a very sophisticated tool stack. Therefore, you spend a lot of money. And what I've seen is that not necessarily, like there's a little mistake in there because I think what you need to have, yes or yes, is a marketing automation tool, of course. You need to have a CRM in place that it's decently taken care of. So like (laughs) that it's clean, that it's manageable, that someone is in the CRM 24-7, that probably you have an architect here and there. So so that's on the tool side. And you don't need like the 34 tools that people are using on a daily basis. Like I think you, you have to have like something to prospect, something to enrich the accounts. Like you have to go each each one of the categories to kind of have the basics. And that doesn't, it's not a, a significant amount of money. Unless you are scaling ABM, in that case, everything changes. But when you start, I think what you need to have is a people element. Because if you don't have sales on board, or even like this is a cascade thing, as most of the things that you are trying to apply in a company. If it doesn't come from leadership and leadership doesn't believe in it, it's going to be really hard to get buy-in. And therefore, the, the, the teams that are coming next are not going to believe in it. And so I think when you have everyone saying, yes, let's give it a try, beautiful things can happen. I have to agree with you because when I've seen it done well, you mentioned it briefly, but like the alignment across teams, the communication has to be solid. It's funny, you also mentioned having a clean CRM. So I was part of the wave. In fact, that's what I used to live in California 20 years ago, selling CRM before people could spell it. And nowadays it's become like everybody's got one, but they're not maintaining it or they're not entering data accurately and it's become old hat. So it's interesting you mentioned it because you got to have clean data and you got to have, and people don't, I don't think focus on functionally how we're using your CRM and and even updating that function, they just leave old processes continue on with old fields in there, and it doesn't become a useful tool or data set to kind of base it on. I'm curious, since we're talking about tools, how has AI affected account-based marketing and revenue ops? I think it's been a really, really nice thing to have. Again, when used properly, you have to be very careful when you talk about the AI with things like privacy, for example. I think we are not talking enough about AI-powered tools that, that can potentially break something in, in, in the privacy structure of a company. But I think AI-powered tools can also help with tasks like, for example, lead scoring. That lead scoring has been a pain for, especially in revenue and revenue operations, for a while. And I don't think people have kind of pinpointed the really good things that you must do in lead scoring. Um, the other thing that you can do with AI-powered tools is content recommendations. I don't believe that content marketers are going to disappear per se, because I think what AI can't replace is creativity. So probably you're going to go to the AI tool to say, give me a brainstorm about this topic. And then the person, like you still need a human to kind of make that break. And then the third thing that I think AI has changed forever, which I'm a very advocate about this is personalization. I think personalization it's one of those things that, for example, for us, is a challenge because the turnaround of, for example, a campaign in a company that, again, it's a matrix company, can be very challenging. Like we can't produce content very fast because the pieces, for example, of research at JLL are one of a kind. Like our research documentation is, is, is something that takes a lot of time for us to, to really put out um, to the public. But I think with AI, I think you are starting to see that you can personalize to the contact level, not only to the industry level, but to the contact level, which is something that a lot of tools have started to, to try to do back in the day, but now they can 100% do it. So for example, Drift, which is a tool that I absolutely love and every time that I can, I want to say fantastic things about them. But all of these contributes 
I think, to an efficient and effective ABM strategy, for sure. So I don't know if this is a pushback, but it's something that I'm seeing. It's funny, we just had a podcast and we talked about this. So some people are using AI to personalize, just like you mentioned, but I think they're doing it very lazy and it's making them all sound exactly the same with exactly the same pitches. In other words, they're relying too heavily on it and they're not reviewing it and looking at it. So it's kind of like I get the same tone, same message from multiple avenues. Any advice on how to not fall into that trap? It's what I'm telling you. Be careful with who you have in your team. A lot of, I was at a dinner last night or two nights ago, and one of my colleagues was saying, I only have two people in content. I don't think I need anyone else. And that's a bold statement because it was a, a sizable company. It was not like a startup or, or anything like that. And so I think you need to be careful of what are the areas that you need a human brain and what are the areas that are very repetitive where, where AI can only exponentially grow that effort. And so again, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be like a, a record here, but a I think the sentiment that you need to produce in a piece of content, AI is really hard for, like, like you can be the best at, at creating products, but at the end, if you don't know exactly what's the tone that, tone that resonates with your audience, you're going to be lost and it's kind of useless. Yep. And so to your point, I've also seen a lot of my LinkedIn feed has became boring, honestly, because I feel like everyone goes to the, to chat GPT and then they put like, create 50 posts about this thing, and then they just kind of put it in a calendar yeah. content. And, and then you see the same post that the same person shared a week ago, but now with some tweaks. And so for me, I'm, I'm missing that sentiment that people used to convey through words that were simpler words or like more sophisticated, depending on the person. And, and then mixing those words is kind of what makes you a great writer. Yeah. Like for God's sake, I was one of the ones that wrote a book before ChatGPT. So I think that makes me a, a good storyteller. I, I don't, it's not that I don't use it because of course I'm, I'm, I use it as much as I can. I think the AI conversation is, is very important because when they say AI is going to replace your job, I don't believe that. But probably someone utilizing AI is going to replace your job. Probably, yes. And so that's why I try to use it as, most, as much as I can. However, I still, every single piece that you see on my LinkedIn has been written by me. I don't put anything through GPT because I feel that I'm going to lose what makes people read me. And so that's equally applicable to your business. You need to be careful of who you hire, what are their tools they're built. Because for example, you can, you can, the need can be like, you need a, a set of tools, but the person is a hammer, you know, like, you know, you know where, where I'm going. So I think being careful in the hiring process, it's something that I can advise to improve. Yeah. Yeah, Larry, you mentioned creativity in the role and congratulations on writing book. It's one of my bucket list items. I just don't know. I don't know how to write, nor do I have any good topics. But besides that, I am all in. I am going to write a book eventually. But you mentioned creativity. So like my sweetheart, she uses AI like a tool, a co-pilot in a way. And I, I like that word. So she'll think of creative topics like, you know, you know, the wine country and how popular it's become in our little part of the U.S. where I live and exploring it. And then she takes those concepts, throws them into chat to kind of, to, 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 or whatever AI, to kind of create the transitions through the story. And then she can read it and tweak it and change it and make things sound like herself. And it's a great tool because she can get an article out much faster versus, you know, someone that does like PR or something like that, you know, they're used to doing that. So the, they churn those things out quickly. But when that's not your background, it's a great tool to use as long as you don't over rely on it, right? You don't make it the storyteller versus yourself. You need to know in the arsenal of things that are accessible now, what are the things that you can leverage and what are the things that will put a stop in your creativity. So for example, I, I was at same dinner and someone was telling me like, Lorena, for your type of work, I think you would be very satisfied with a tool called Order that it's a, it's a, it's a note taker and you can send the tool to a meeting if you can't access all the meetings. And then the thing records everything and you can see a summary of like, this person says this or like, what would you recommend as an answer to the person that said this? Like things that for me are, are like, okay, that is useful. I could use that because 90% of my time is in meetings. 
do I want to be in, in meetings all my day? Probably no, because I don't have enough time to ideate, to, to create, to prototype, to all the things that are really close to my heart. So when I heard that, I was like, I'm totally going to give it a try because that's brilliant, right? Like you have identified a gap that can be closed with AI. That for me, it's like, like I'll, I'll clap all day for that. But if you're using it to kind of numb some of your abilities, that's a no. You've gone too far. That's so interesting because I'm going to tie this into our, our two questions that we ask everyone towards the end of every podcast. And Lorena, as someone who's been working in multiple roles now for 20 years, you are a target for prospectors. So when when you get prospected to, what are some of the things that you l- would like to see that you might even respond to? And then on the flip side, you know, we're talking AI, we know it's going to be used improperly in prospecting. What are some of the big no's not to do? I think that's an easy one. We don't, like we became very, like our standards are really high, but at the same time, everyone wants someone that gets you and that has taken the time to analyze you correctly. Because I've had like the two extents, like I've had someone that literally growed me and I, and I made a post about this in, on LinkedIn because it, it made my blood boil. Someone <laughs> literally told me, I can see you're a founder of JLM. Based on that, I want to offer you this and this and this. And I'm like, on the basic, basic, basic side, you will know that JLL is a 300-year-old company. So you're implying that I'm like 400 years old or something. So that's a no. Like, at least take the time to go in my feed. Like, if someone wants to find something about me, most likely it's already out there because I'm a very public person. And so if you only take the time to go for it, you're going to find something that is going to resonate with me. I had also a beautiful one that... um took my picture that I uploaded from the Japan trip that I was mentioning you. And this was months ago. Like someone really had to go deep in it to kind of find it. And they did. And they sent me um, something relatable about the artist saying like, it's going to be exhibited here. Did you know about this? That caught my attention right away. I was like, okay, you have my attention. What do you want? I'll take the meeting. So I think it's basic human nature. Like just take the time to really analyze a person it's like when you go to an event and, and you want to start small talk. Talking about the weather, for me, it's a no. Like, I don't want to listen how is the weather in Washington or in Chicago or like, I already know. Like, tell me something about that kept you awake last night or like the top five things that you haven't been able to resolve in your job. You see where I'm going? Like, it's not that far to be relatable because we're humans at the end. We like to call it value-based interruptions, right? Can you provide something of value to the person you're prospecting is to get their attention, to earn the right to have a conversation. So I love that. I'll give you a compliment and then I'll give you our last question of the day. So one compliment I have for you, hey, thanks for embracing you know your Latin side of you because I don't think we do that enough for other Latins. I try to do that all the time and I, I appreciate it in you. And then for our insight, acceleration insight of the day, which is our last question of the day is usually hey, what's that little piece of advice that you would like to share with our listeners, be it business or personal, that helps them be as successful as you? Sometimes people say, like, go with the flow. I would say it's not applicable always because going with the flow implies that you go with the masses. Yeah. And I've tried to do the opposite. And so believing that you can be different, it's a game changer. Nobody believed that I could be in revenue operations because I come from traditional marketing. I don't come from the systems. I don't come from the operations. And still, I'm leading a team of really successful people that know how to do the things that I don't. But if I would believe people when they tell me like, no way that you can do this, I wouldn't be here. So I think it it gets back to don't go with the flow. Go with your flow and go with what makes sense for you at the time that you are living. Because timing, it's another thing that it's very, it has to be perfect timing. So that would be my advice. Try to on go with the flow, pretty much. That's great advice. Find the gap in the flow and fill it. Perfect. Lorena, thank you so much for being with us today. If any of our listeners wanted to get in touch with you, what's your preferred method of communication? LinkedIn. I don't discriminate anyone. I don't say no to anyone. Just try not to sell me the first time that you join my network, unless you sell me very well. If that's the case, then go for it. But yeah, LinkedIn. You can find me on LinkedIn and and you're going to see me there talking about many, many things. (laughs) <laughs> and not using ChatGPT to do it. <laughs> so, well, thank you again for taking the time today. We we really appreciate it and we know how valuable it is. Thank you, both Carlos and Lisa. It's been a pleasure to me and thank you to the audience.
All right, everyone, that does it for this episode. Please check us out at www.b2brevexec.com. Share this episode with your friends, your family, your coworkers, and you can subscribe through YouTube, Spotify, or Google Podcasts. And if you like what you hear, you can do us a huge favor and throw us a five-star re- review on iTunes. I'm Lisa Schneer, and I'm joined by my lovely podcast partner, Carlos Noche. And <laughs> Carlos and I wish you nothing but the greatest success. You've been listening to the B2B Revenue Executive Experience. To ensure that you never miss an episode, subscribe to the show on iTunes or your favorite podcast player. Thank you so much for listening. Until next time.